Millions of years ago, a hyper-intelligent race of interdimensional beings got so fed up knowing everything there was to know about the universe that they decided to build a stupendously powerful supercomputer into which they would input all of the data they had in all of the galaxies in order to answer the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. They wanted to get the answer to life, the universe, and everything. So they built Deep Thought, this computer here, and 6.8 million years later, Deep Thought came up with the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And the answer was? A cultured audience. I couldn't be in a better place. This, of course, is part of uh, the great works of Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the trilogy in four parts. Um, Douglas Adams was a, a hero of mine. Uh, I, in fact, worked with him when I was still at medical school. Um, and he talked about this, this, this concept of exponentially advancing technologies. He, he described this small device, this is about 40 years ago, which would fit in your pocket, which would contain all the knowledge there was to know, and it would guide you through life. It, he called it the Hitchhiker's Guide, and it's the thing that you guys are all tapping on now, or have got in your pockets. Um, exponentially advancing technologies are transforming my profession, healthcare, at an incredible pace. Um, if, if you look at the way computation is, is moving, in 100 years' time, we will be in a completely different world. But to answer where we will be in 100 years' time, we've got to go back to the past first. 100 years ago, we were still doing terrible things with malaria. We were having people that made cornflakes talk about how medicine should be prescribed. And 100 years on, we are able to look at vessels that we were never able to see before in the heart and see stuff which was going to go pop that no one's been able to uh, ever, even if even radiologists were not able to detect. We are folding proteins with the most complicated algorithms that are imaginable. Uh, Google have managed to win prizes on this. And, and of course, we're, we're making vaccines at the speed of light. This is from zero to now. It's just quite astonishing. So where will we be in 100 years' time? Well, to answer that question, we've got to go even further back in time to before Hippocrates, to my favorite time in history. Let's see if your culture really is here. Okay, who's this? Darth Vader? Yeah? Darth Vader. Good. Very cultured audience. I'm really liking this audience. It's fantastic. Darth Vader represents the future of medical technology. Let me explain why. Vader had 100% burns, really screwed up internal organs, no arms and no legs, some psychological problems, some minor issues, and of course, it was never formally diagnosed whether it was asthma or COPD, but, but it doesn't matter because Mr. Vader was able to run the galaxy and live life to the full with the help of a lot of medical devices and home testing, and I think you'll agree that he really is the future of medical technology. But the inspiration uh, for Vader doesn't come from him, it comes from his line manager. Emperor Palpatine, um, who um, is, is, Ian McDermott played the character in Star Wars. He, he, he's a brilliant Shakespearean act, actor, and um, uh, and it's quite well known um, that apart from shooting shooting lightning from his fingers, he he also suffered a heart attack on stage in 2008. Um, and his agents actually called us up and said, "You guys." stick sensors on Formula One drivers and so on. C can't you tell in advance whether this stuff was happening? And we calculated the price and we said, yeah, it would have, there'd be wires everywhere and big batteries and it would cost 10,000 bucks and you can't do that on stage. But it did get us thinking about where things would be going. And just as a small aside, um, 
this is actually the most important text message that has ever been sent to me by anybody. It's the emperor himself wishing me Happy New Year, which I've got to say is like... Uh, it's important to me anyway. Right, moving on. Um, I don't actually work uh, on the Death Star. Um, I, I work in uh, my institute in London, at Imperial College London, um, and uh, we study human performance science at elite athletes. Uh, we apply that human performance science not just to the people doing the craziest things uh, or to uh, celebrities doing charity challenges like running 41 marathons in 50 days and swimming the channel even though they've never swum before, um, or even things like this where you get thrown into cage fights uh, for the name of science. This is actually true. I did. Um, that's me. I lost. Um, but uh, we, we, we did some home testing stuff, uh, see if we could actually prove whether doing more things for yourself at home would work, and measured both sides of my body and healed one half and not the other. So this stuff is really bad science, but it's, uh, it's good for stage. But we do serious stuff as well. Um, we apply all of this science, all of this data, all of this biosensor stuff in order to help people who are going through the toughest challenges in disease and going through the sort of very, very serious environments like Antarctica and the South Pole. Um, we produce an enormous amount of data from our laboratories. Um, it's very difficult to comprehend, but it's very powerful as well. Um, the kind of data that we can, can plot over time about a person's physiology can actually predict, notwithstanding getting hit by a, uh, struck by lightning or hit by a car, when it is that you're likely to die. So it's very, very powerful stuff. Um, it's the same kind of level of resolution of data that you get in the airline industry. This is the, uh, this is the airline that, uh, that took me over, the plane that took me over from London to, uh, to, 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 uh, to Helsinki earlier. And this, on a transatlantic flight, will, will, will produce about uh, 600 gigabytes of data, um, which equates to 100 million pages of A4. That's longer than your average doctor's report. Okay, um, And in fact, the airline industry is a great example because it produces a staggering amount of data each year. In fact, about 300 billion pages of reports per second. And that is why the airline industry is probably the safest thing um, that, we, that, that we know about that's dangerous. Uh, this, on the other hand, is what happened when I was born. We measured my height and weight every year. Um, would you get in an airplane that had one measurement in 50 years? N no, you wouldn't. Uh, and yet, this is basically what we do to our bodies. Um, it really does put insight that, in fact, the fact that we're not testing ourselves, we're not doing more stuff more frequently, makes healthcare dangerous, and we have to do something about it. In 2012, I was invited to this thing called Singularity University, which is very much on the future of everything. Um, and this is now 10 years ago. The kind of stuff that you're seeing on the wall here was utterly breakthrough at the time. And now, this is all completely old. Everything has shrunk, everything has become more powerful. I'm wearing some of those things. I'm sure some of you have got the rings and the watches and the patches uh, that, are doing, that are doing infinitely more just, just from 10 years ago. One of our charity challenges was taking some of these biosensors, some of these data, stuck it on a very famous footballer, Alan Shearer there, when he was beating, he was, he was uh, racing against his friend, Robbie Savage, on sitting on every seat in Wembley Stadium, and we tried to see who was going to win. So we stuck a biosensor on them. This is just the kind of thing that would have cost £10,000 back in the day in 2008. And we measured all these different metrics in real time, wirelessly as they sat on every seat in Wembley Stadium. And we could predict who was going to win. And in fact, Alan did win quite, quite, uh, quite considerably. How much do you think that amount of data, those kinds of devices, cost today? We're talking about heart rate, ECG, live, respiratory rate, your body posture, your calories. How much do you think this costs? It's a dollar. It's a dollar a day. Exponentially advancing technologies. Uh, do you want me to throw it? Uh, uh, do you want to win? It's got my, it's got my chest hair on it. You, <laughs> you don't want it. You don't want it. So um, as a bit of a research project, we pulled together some of these biosensors, these home monitoring things. Um, we built some algorithmic prediction stuff around it. And we were able to tell days in advance of people actually going to hospital whether they were going to get sick. Uh, it was, a lot of that was published. We called the project Jointly Health. Uh, we had to change the name because in California, everyone was phoning us up wanting medical marijuana. 
can choose your name wisely. Um, and it is important, though, because heart failure, neurodegenerative diseases, complex problems with diabetes, cancer, you know, the, the, big, the big five um, are costing an incredible amount of money. This is old data, but it's, we are talking about trillions of wasted dollars um, and obviously suffering and lives. Hopefully, uh, a dollar a day should be able to put a big dent into some of these complex chronic diseases. Professor Martinelli is a, is a big uh, hero of mine. He bathes uh, 3D printed lung in stem cells. He sticks that into kids who end up living happy lives who otherwise would have died. Uh, but he goes around the world saying about how unsustainable healthcare is. Um, and the fact is that this is old data as well. We have utterly failed to expand our healthcare services. If you try to make healthcare in its traditional form more efficient, it ain't going to work. Um, GDP is increasing. We're in a mess. And part of the reason why we're in a mess is because we're all getting older and there's not as many of us to look after us, both in the healthcare system relatively and children. Biology is hard. I'm not saying that we're going to fix things just with sensors, okay? This is metabolic pathways of the human body, just a tiny fragment of it. And also another grand challenge we've got is that healthcare politics is hard. This is the regulatory framework of which 95% of it is how money flows. It's not to do with patient safety, it's to do with cash. And of course there's politics. I, li I like Photoshop. Okay, um, so you know the dark side here is regulation. Um, we need to move faster, we need to try things, but we can't break people. Uh, two great books if you want to read them, talking about both sides of it. Um, we believe that there is an absolute necessity for thoroughness when you're developing really, really good breakthrough uh, technologies that help us to treat people earlier and at home. Um, but you've got to be careful as well because, you know, it could be Theranos or it could be Theranos. But don't panic because COVID saved us. COVID changed us from not testing ourselves at all, except when we're 50, maybe once, do our blood pressure, to every single week we were testing ourselves. We suddenly felt the authority and the power to do more stuff for ourselves. We started a project um, looking at how we could teach people to meet medical grade testing capabilities themselves without a doctor or a nurse or anyone telepresent or physically present. And we collected this data thoroughly. And I just want to point out on the left, on the right hand side here is the quality of a professional. We scored it 10 out of 10. Self-testing, we scored it between one and eight. The lower the better, I won't, won't bore you with why, but the lower the scores the better. Self-tested self people can perform as well, if not better, than trained clinicians using technology and with remote quality assurance in the background, privacy preserved. It's on the wall. It's possible. Um, we did this all remotely, and that was another real, really amazing thing about it. My two co-founders, who I'm very, very privileged to work with, uh, built this uh, project from scratch uh, across two different countries um, without physically being with each other for a year and a half, which is another really interesting phenomenon that we're seeing in uh, in healthcare. So that's Tarvat Hinrikas from Skype and TransferWise fame, and Lise Narusk, who's very well known to this audience here at, at, uh, at Latitude, an innovator um, across Estonia, and me in the middle, if you didn't notice. So is this another Skype moment for healthcare? Can we take the infrastructure out and give power into the hands of people? Uh, we did a 15,000 person trial to see whether or not we could get people to uh, do quality testing. We published a lot of paper, papers on this, on, on this matter. So again, this is not just hearsay. If you hear people on stage talking about stuff, ask for the data. And the name was very important. Okay? We called it Certific because we want to certify that people can achieve the same quality as folk like me. We all can. And I don't think we're going to be asked about medical marijuana. But that might be a good idea, actually, nowadays. We want to eliminate all avoidable appointments. 
We want to take the burden out of healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, clinics. We want to expand and accelerate trials. More people should have access to be able to sign up to trials, understand what they are and participate in them. You don't have to be within five kilometers of a big teaching center. And we just want to make the experience of prescribing and getting something quickly delivered to your home just better. It's as simple as that. And we do that by giving us all superpowers. So I can go to the pub more. The essence of this is a decentralized healthcare future. In order to get there, we've got to benefit from the exponentially advancing uh, trend in digitization and in miniaturization. We've got to educate people, both sides of the profession, the doctors, the patients, that this is possible. We have to delegate into the hands of the people with the problems. We have to do it at home. We have to personalize it. Can't just be a one size fits all. It's got to be cheaper and it's got to be deregulated, but not really deregulated, live regulated. We've just got to get quicker iterating what is accepted to be safe by the authorities. And that means digitizing trust. And that is the essence of what we're doing. And of course, it wouldn't be a tech talk at a conference if it wasn't all about AI, right? So I'll just leave you with this. Don't underestimate the power of data in exponentially advancing technologies. Um, don't underestimate the power of yourselves. You can do better than me. <laughs> and of course, don't underestimate the power of the dark side. Thank you. Stay there, stay there, stay there. Stay for a quick second. Uh, since we have a few extra minutes, does anyone have a question? There's so much in there. So much to marinate, so many different thoughts, and a lot of good Photoshop, good Photoshop skills. So yeah, any questions? Yes. We'll get a mic to you over there in the blue shirt. Blue You've got good shirt. eyes. I can't see anything with the bright lights, yeah. Hi. And the haze coming through. Yes. Hi, my name is Richard. Uh, very inspiring. How, how do you see, I mean, this is all about equality in society, in humanity somehow. How do you see why do we have to extend life into eternity somehow? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's funny that we, I just came back from a conference dedicated to this. And um, we're, we're very much focused on helping people who simply can't get hold of a doctor to be able to prescribe a really important antibiotic within the, or an antiviral within a window that makes sense. This is not about re-engineering your body to live forever. But you know, as technologies advance, we will be, if there's money to be made from it, we will be forced into buying it. And I think that that's actually a, a dark but interesting topic for another conference. Well, Richard organizes conferences, so maybe he'll get you at his. <laughs> any, uh, any other questions? Yes, the question over there. First of all, uh, thank you for a very good speech. Um, I'm very, a little bit curious. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned education there, and I would assume that you, you also mentioned not like doctors, but also like uh, regular people like us, like how we educate. So we are living in the area where we, everyone has their own beliefs about their health, about their, what they should do, how they should live their lives. In your data, what you are looking, how do you presume that uh, we can give the quality education to the regular people so that, who are not doctors, that we can make better decisions? Uh, let's say the recent case with the vaccinations, either you are for or against, do you believe or not? How do you improve the education for the regular people? Thank you. Good question. Uh, it's a brilliant question, and thank you very much for your, uh, uh, your thanks as well. Um, look, w before modern medicine came around, we all used to self-care, right? We, we were self-carers, there was no profession. And what we've turned into now is we've gone so far the other way. Medicine has become incredibly technical, massively regulated, and a huge number of us feel kind of dissociated from the science and the profession 
and, and we kind of don't even listen, even though the science and the profession do know what they're talking about. They communicate it in the worst possible way. It's patronizing. It's it, and it goes back centuries for when the physician was kind of like a holy figure that knew stuff that no one else knew. And part of what we're doing, not as a not a directly, but by putting stuff back into the hands of the patient, and we have to thank COVID for this, to be honest. By putting stuff back into the hands of the patient, rapidly, I believe, we can teach people to be confident about more of what science is saying in the background, but at least they own it. And that's one of the things that we're going to measure. It's not just how many tests we can do for, you know, STIs, COVID, viruses, you know, hormones, but also how much people understand of what it is that they're being told and, and doing for themselves. Any final questions? We'll take one more question from over here in the brown jacket. Hi, thank you for the presentation. My name is Elena and I have a question. Um, do you think that the patient can actually own the data if um, the service is provided by someone else, like the state, for example, is providing the service, but then you're saying that the person, the patient has to take um, action and basically their health into their own hands. And we have all these digital products, but who is owning this data and can then the patient actually own the data and then go and, um, sorry, and, and then um, use the, um, for example, their health records some, someplace else, for example, like a digital marketplace. Um, Brilliant question. One of the problems with health data uh, is that it's not looked after as well as medical data. So, you know, when you sign up to Aura or something, God knows where it's going, basically, because I bet you haven't read the small print. OK, um, what I would say is that we treat all of we personally take the stance of all data is medical data. It's medical grade and we can't do anything with it unless it's with your permission. Um, but the value of the data, because we have taken the stance of everything that you do needs to be at clinical grade quality, quality assured, it actually means you could do more with it. So if you, for instance, would want to opt to give your records or your data to a trial, you wouldn't have to do all the tests again because we know you've done it to clinical grade. So it, I feel it's a win-win. If you treat everybody with the respect that you should a patient, the data will be more protected and also be more useful. All right. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Thanks for being here. Thank you.